author is funded by the Pacific Northwest Writers Association, supporting writers from pen to publication since 1955. To learn more about the PNWA and their yearly conference, please go to pnwa.org. Hi, this is Bill Knauer for Author Magazine, and today I'm in the Seattle home of Nancy Kress, author of Yesterday's Kin. Nancy, welcome to Author. Thank you. I'm delighted to have the chance to do this interview. So, Nancy, let's begin at the beginning. Even before you started writing, when did you first say to yourself, I care about stories? They are interesting to me. I actually remember the exact moment that this started, not the writing, because I didn't start writing until I was in my late 20s. But when I was about seven, my parents gave a party. And I wanted to be out at the party. I didn't want to be in bed. And I kept coming out with more and more excuses and more and more excuses. I needed a glass of water. I had to go to the bathroom. And I remember my father put me to bed firmly. And he said, now just stay there and tell yourself a pretty story. <laughs> and he closed the bedroom door. And I did. I, at that time, Saturday morning cartoons were all Westerns. So I told myself a story where there was this big gang with the Lone Ranger in it and, and um, Tonto and Gene Autry and Roy Rogers and all the people I watched, and I was in the gang too. And that started the telling of stories for decades, much later than I want to admit. I would tell myself stories as I went to bed, in which I was always one of them, a person that was in the story. But I never expected to be a writer. It wasn't. I was a fourth grade teacher. That's what I planned for. And the reason I stopped was I got married and I had to my first husband and I started having children. And we lived way out in the country. There were no other people, on the, no other women my age on the road. They were all older and had gone back to work. My then husband took the only car to work and he was taking an MBA in the evening so oftentimes he would stay down town. And I had one toddler running around and was pregnant with my second child and I was going nuts, completely nuts. And when the baby was sleeping, I started writing stories just to have some intellectual activity that involved more than one syllable and wasn't centered on Sesame Street. And I would send the stories off, and they would come back, and I'd send them off, and they would come back. And after a year, one sold. And after another year, another sold. And after that, it began to pick up a little. But it, it was not anything I had ever planned on doing. What, when you started writing, and you were writing fantasy, or was Initially, it? a mixture of science fiction and fantasy, but the first three novels were fantasy. What year was this? This was in the late 70s? Mid the, first, the first story was published in 1976. Were you reading Tolkien? Were you, what, were you, what was your, where did you come from as a reader? I didn't like Tolkien. <gasps> wow. I, I know. I had always read absolutely everything. Okay. I was one of those kids that would read the back of cereal boxes if there was nothing else available, right. the back of ketchup bottles. And I've never known a writer who wasn't, at least when they were young a voracious yeah. reader. And I would read everything. I would read classics that I didn't understand. I would read my father's Zane Grey books, which he had in the, up in the attic, and I was up to 26 before I realized they all had the same plot. <laughs> I would read the confession magazines my mother hid in the linen closet. I read absolutely everything. And I didn't discover science fiction until I was 14. And there was a strange reason for this. The school I went to, the elementary school, had a boy section and a girl section. Again, we're talking free, free women's movement. Yeah. And all the science fiction was in the boy section. It was marked with little rockets on the back. And all the fantasy was in the girl section. So I read the Andrew Lang Bluff book of fairy tales and the Andrew Lang plaid book of fairy tales, but I never saw any science fiction until I was 14. And then I had my first boyfriend who was studying to be a concert pianist. And then after school, I would go and hang adoringly over the piano while he practiced. Well, I'm tone deaf. I can hang adoringly for 10 minutes tops. So I started pulling books off the shelves in his family's living room, and I came across Arthur Clarke's Childhood's End. It was the first science fiction I had ever seen. And three pages in, I was in love and not with the pianist. That was, was such a large canvas. That's what I liked about it. And so when you, were, when you started as a writer, what came easiest to you? What, what did you not have to learn? English prose because I had read so much and because I was always a good student. Did I, you have a good ear? Yes, I have a good yeah. ear for the cadence of English prose. Yeah. I don't have a good ear for music, but I have a good ear for words. Also, characterization came fairly easy because people interest me. And from the time I was quite small, I knew that they were complicated. 
and one of the things I'm the most pleased about in the reactions to my work is that it is frequently praised for the characterization. The hardest thing for me was plot. Even when I was telling myself for all those decades, all those stories, they never ended because I, they did not, I did not have a sense of the shape of a plot. Yeah. And that, that was hard for me to learn. How did you learn that? I mean, when you think back over your, your, your education, as a, your self-education, it sounds like, as a writer, um, how did you teach yourself that? Well, it was partly trial and error, which all writers do. And it was partly feedback from my peers. For several years, I attended a writing workshop in North Carolina called Sycamore Hill, run by John Kessel. And 17 writers would meet on the North Carolina State campus for a week. And we would critique each other's work all morning, read each other's work all afternoon, argue about science fiction all night. A lot of wine helped this process <laughs> go down smooth. <laughs> But it's very, very useful to get feedback from your peers and from those that are better than you are directly to your work. For instance, here's a, here's a story that happened at Sycamore Hill. There's a writer called Bruce Sterling, a science fiction writer, very, very good science fiction writer. And I had submitted a story that I knew was not one of my strongest, but the workshop was coming up and I had to have something to bring, so I brought it. And Bruce, who is a wonderful writer, but not a tactful man, when it came to his turn to talk about my story, he said, well, Cress, and I wish I could do the Texas accent for you, but I can't. Well, Cress, this is a pretty good thing of its kind, but unfortunately its kind is obsolete and all you're doing is re rearranging decorations on a moldy literary cake. <laughs> then it went downhill from that. But his basic point was that in designing this alien society, I had not started with economics. I had not considered where are the resources coming from, how are they allocated, and then built a society that made logical sense based on that. And this was, to me, a tremendous insight. I went home, I licked my wounds for a couple of weeks, I thought about it, and the next thing I wrote is arguably my most successful work, Beggars in Spain, which deals partly with the question, what do the haves owe the have-not in a capitalistic society? And I had started to think about this in a way to apply it to science fiction that I had not thought about it before. Did you have to go through the thing of saying, I belong on that shelf next to the people that your name is Cress, and so I don't know who in the science fiction world has K, but you could line up right next to your idols. No, I had very low expectations in the beginning because I was doing this um, as a sort of sideline. I expected to turn return to fourth grade teaching, which I never did. Right. Um, but it was not... I never thought I'm going to set out to win awards, I'm going to set out to have novels translated into many, many foreign languages, I'm going to set out um, to be a large success. Some of those things have happened, the awards and the, the multi-language volumes, but it, it, I never planned on it. My whole career has sort of been stumbling from one thing to the next in an unplanned kind of way. Do you have disobedient characters? Who have their oh, own ideas about I like that. Yeah. I like it when a character just takes wing. My friend Connie Willis and I once were on a panel and we were discussing this. And I said just that, that my favorite part about writing is when the character just suddenly ups and does something I hadn't planned and I follow it. And she goes, Nancy, wait, wait, wait. They can't do anything that you don't give them to do. They don't exist. And I said, I She's know. She's a writer. She's a very good writer. And I said, I know, Connie, but that's how it feels. That's what it feels like. Well, you are in the majority, I should tell you. Uh, of all the hundreds of writers I've talked to, I would say 90% of them have that relationship to their characters. It's the fewer who say no. They're like the galley slaves that Nabokov Well, and I'm going to tell Connie. Tell her. It's true. It's almost <laughs> all of them. In fact, I would say most, most writers look forward to that moment where yes. now yes. they know it's real. It's one of the two good moments. The other good moment is when you're so deeply in the story that you forget who you are and where you are. And if somebody comes in and speaks to you, there's a couple seconds of dissociation where you're coming out of that other world and into this one, and you look around and go, oh, yeah, I'm here. Because you're not, you're there. And it's the same thing that can happen when you're reading a book and you're intensely caught up in it. All right, well, Nancy, I've got one more question for you. And what I'd like you to do is uh, finish the sentence for me. If writing has taught me anything, it's taught me what? You can make a living doing something you genuinely love. 
if you're willing to take risks.